is shrouded in myth and legend. Ancient Muslim chronicles talk of an epic battle in 1179. On one side, Christians from Europe, known as Crusaders, soldiers of the cross. On the other, Muslim warriors. The outcome changes the course of a 200-year struggle for control of the Holy Land. The chronicles say that after furious and intense fighting, the entire Crusader garrison is either slaughtered or enslaved. For centuries, there is no way to prove or disprove this incredible story. Then, archaeologists discover something extraordinary. The bones of Crusaders left on the battlefield by the victorious Muslim army. This is the exact place where we started finding all kinds of skeletons of human beings and of horses. We see the drama, the actual men that were killed during the battle. You can see the agony. They are the first skeletons ever excavated of crusaders killed in combat. Finding out who they are and how they died could reveal what really happened at Jacob's Ford. Forensic anthropologist Mick Wazoki, an expert on battle wounds, examines six of the skeletons, each one a chapter in the story. They were all male, aged between 18 to 40. This is an astonishing group of individuals. Many of them show signs of sharp force trauma and brutal injuries. One stands out immediately. This individual suffered the most appalling series of injuries. We can see this here in his lower jaw, his mandible, blow struck at an angle, probably splitting the chin in two. We know that it's a blow from a sword because the break is very, very straight and even. A second wound is far worse. It severs his left arm. The cut is actually coming down at an angle through here and cutting through here. Also, in this photograph, we can see how clean and sharp it is. This isn't a natural break in bone at all. This is a cut. One blow, and the arm was gone. These wounds are evidence of a focused attack on one man. Their ferocity is a clue to his identity. These injuries are typical of hand-to-hand -hand combat. They're all to the front of the body. But he wasn't running away. He was standing and fighting. So it looks as if he was very likely targeted. He might have been recognized as a very powerful warrior that had to be brought down at all costs. The evidence suggests he could be one of the most enigmatic crusaders of all, a Templar knight. According to the Muslim chronicles, the men garrisoning the castle are led by 80 of these holy warriors. The Knights Templar are a group of warrior monks. They're people dedicated to the defense of the Holy Land. They took vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. But the crucial difference is they fight the devil with swords, while monks will fight the devil with prayer. Templar knights are men of noble birth, trained as warriors, from as young as 12. They are the Crusader Special Forces. Their weapon of choice is the broadsword. This weapon is an incredibly devastating weapon. It's a double-edged sword, which means that when you pick it up, you can use either edge. So it's very versatile. It's well-balanced. 
So when we're fighting, we can move the sword rapidly. And as well as being a cutting sword, it's also equally a thrusting sword. The cut or the thrust. When the Muslims attack Jacob's Ford, the Knights Templar lead the defense. They believe dying for Christ will make them martyrs and guarantee a place in heaven. Their unshakable faith would keep them fighting, even through terrible injuries. The Templars are the best troops the Christians have got. They train, they've got the best kit, they're disciplined. They have a remarkable reputation for courage. If other knights were training hard, Templars would have been trained twice as hard. The advance, the retreat, the pass. It's all about practice, practice, practice. But despite his training, the Templar knight skeleton reveals he is overwhelmed. The jaw is split in two. The face is a particularly nasty area to be injured because there are so many nerve endings. Even a small cut is very painful. The left arm is hacked off. The weapon responsible is most likely the Muslim scimitar. This is a real cleaving weapon, swinging through, cutting with the curved blade a smaller area of the blade hits home first, which means that all the force of the blow hits on that singular point, then it just widens the cut as it draws through. Now, this leg of lamb also has a bone running through it, and this is a pure example of the cleaving ability of the scimitar. Using the weight of the blade, I would easily remove his arm. Driven by his faith, the knight fights on, aided by his body's response to injury. If a soldier's on the battlefield and, for instance, he loses his arm, there's every reason to suppose that he can still continue fighting. Physiologically, the mechanism allowing them to do that is the adrenaline that's pumping around their body, constricting the blood vessels from the wound reducing their concept of pain, pushing them on to fight. But the brutal attack isn't over. On excavation, there's an arrowhead lodged in his neck. The main compromise of function would be the ability to breathe. That's one of the major killers on a battlefield, the loss of the airway. Incredibly, None of these wounds are his cause of death. There's a fourth and final act. The blow that we think probably killed him is this blow that we can see to the front of his skull here. Very sharp break running through the bone here has actually split the whole bone in two. And that's certainly a killing blow it may well have been struck while he was already on his knees. The Templar Knight's death is like an execution. If the blow penetrated the brain, there'd be massive hemorrhage and you would drop to the ground like a stone. His violent martyrdom is evidence that the savage fighting described in the Chronicles is accurate. But how the Muslim army stormed the castle and overwhelmed the rest of the garrison remains shrouded in mystery. According to the Chronicles, the Crusaders butchered at Jacob's Ford die as a result of a single fateful decision.
It is made a year earlier, in 1178. The balance of power in the Holy Land is evenly poised. The Christian leader is Baldwin IV, the leper king of Jerusalem. Baldwin IV was an incredible young man. He was king when he was only 13 years old, and by then he was suspected of having leprosy. And of course, tragically, it's extremely disfiguring. And yet, in spite of this painful, debilitating illness, he held on to the crown of Jerusalem. Baldwin's most aggressive troops, the Knights Templar, pressure him to build a super fortress on the edge of Muslim territory. This is the place, Jacob's Ford. It's a provocative act. From here, the Crusaders can attack the Muslim capital, Damascus, just a day's march away. The plan is to build an expensive and impregnable castle, fortified by two huge circular walls. The castle was intended to be big, bigger than any castle which was built in this part of the world and in Europe at the time. Baldwin's decision to build the castle throws down the gauntlet to the Muslim world. The response seals the fate of these six men. The unusual resting place of the second skeleton examined begins to unlock the sequence of events. Unlike the others, his body wasn't flung without any ceremony to one side, but looks very much as if it was laid to rest formally. If there was time to bury this man properly, he must have died before the Muslims stormed the castle. His bones could explain why. This is his collarbone. This is a collarbone uh, from one of the other Jacob's Ford warriors. If we just compare the two, you can see the size difference quite clearly. This was a very big man. His body is also very muscular. If we look at his humerus, that's his upper arm, you can see that it's very strong development of muscle attachment sites. We can see this very large area of swelling. And when muscles attach into the bone, and then that muscle is used over and over again, it'll cause the bone to grow more. Everything about his physique suggests he's a powerfully built warrior. But his bones show no sign of the combat injuries typical of a fighter. In fact, even more mysteriously, there doesn't seem to be any evidence of any healed injuries either. Only one part of this man's skeleton hasn't yet been examined. His skull. Well, this is even more mysterious. There is this area here at the base of the skull where we've got a semicircular fracture and a radiating fracture leading away from it. But again, there's no impact point here. The damage to the skull was not caused by a violent blow, but most likely by the wear and tear of being buried for 800 years. With no combat injuries anywhere on his body, this man is an unlikely warrior. Another clue offers a different explanation to his identity. He's got very strong development where ligaments hold your collarbone in towards the neck muscles. This suggests a rotary movement of the shoulders. He was using both his arms, movements in this direction, perhaps lifting weights as well. This insight suggests he's one of the castle's most valued non-combatants, a stonemason. Medieval stonemasons serve a back-breaking seven-year apprenticeship to master their craft, skills essential for building castles. Ah! 
When the Muslims attack on day one of the siege, the outer wall is still under construction. Run! Get Everybody was caught by surprise. I mean, this group of workmen were not given any warning. You find the arrowheads amongst the tools and in the cement that they were mixing in order to build the core of the wall. They're just everywhere. Get back! Get back! I would think that in order to protect yourself, you would take your hoe, your pick, whatever you were working with and try and defend yourself with it. The trail of clues suggests a preemptive strike in which the first victims are unarmed craftsmen. It's most likely the stonemason dies from a serious arrow wound to soft tissue. In the medieval age, with no antibiotics, infection is likely. If you have a deep arrow wound and you can't get all of the arrow out, it would have been a very long, slow, painful death. You may have even taken about three days to die. As the stonemason's life ebbs away, a huge Muslim army surrounds Jacob's Ford. The chronicles say the plain overflowed with troops. Behind castle walls, there's still time to bury the dead but not for long. The fate of Jacob's Ford is now in the hands of the great Muslim leader, Saladin. Saladin was incredibly charismatic, but he's also extremely tough. He's determined to destroy Jacob's Ford. It's been built in his lands. He needs to attack this place before it's finished. He's got to hit it hard before it gets too powerful, too complete. On the sixth day of the siege, Saladin executes his devastating plan. His engineers have been digging a tunnel under the castle walls. The tunnels were not intended to uh, let the soldiers, the Muslim soldiers, in, but to make the walls collapse. The only hope for the men trapped inside the castle is King Baldwin, who is gathering reinforcements nearby. For Saladin, it's a race against the clock. Time was short. Saladin is pushing his men to finish it as fast as possible. To bring down the castle walls, they will burn away the tunnel's wooden support props. Richard, land the wall. When all the burning materials will be uh, consumed, the wall will collapse. The final ingredient is likely to be naphtha, an early form of gasoline used by the Muslims. This is the only part along the walls where the walls are missing. Here, I believe, the tunnel was dug and the walls came tumbling down. The Muslim chronicles describe the moment. The wall crumbled. The current of air which penetrated at that moment spread the fire. Several combatants were prey to the flames.
The collapse of the wall allows Saladin's warriors to storm into the castle. The battle is now decided in just a few hours of savage hand-to-hand -hand combat. Four more skeletons have stories to tell. Each one a chapter in what happens next. This skeleton has a single serious injury. This is actually a beautiful, if you can use such an adjective for something as brutal as this, sharp force trauma injury that's cut right through the top of the shoulder and down into the arm. We can see this bone here, and a blow has come down here and cut right through the bone there. The sword has been used it's on the anterior, that's the front part of the humerus. It means that he's facing his enemy, he's in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Surprisingly, for a powerful sword wound, the bone is largely intact. Maybe he was wearing armor, and the chainmail armor actually took a lot of the force of the blow. If this man wears chainmail, it's possible he is a Templar sergeant. Richard, man the wall. As many as five of these men from lower class backgrounds serve each Templar knight. They wear black robes over chainmail, tend the knight's horses, and fight by his side. The Templar sergeants are an integral part of the knight's fighting force. These men take the full vows of a Templar and are just as battle-hardened. Templar sergeants are professional soldiers who know how to fight mean and dirty. When you have the press of battle, you've got bodies upon bodies pressing on you, you are in a very restricted area. Here. I'd use the pommel. Here, driving the quillians into the face. Here, in, in with the head. Remember, I'll be wearing a helmet. Here, kick into the belly, follow through with the cut. If you can't fight with the close quarter combat, then you're only half a swordsman. At the Battle of Jacob's Ford, this Templar sergeant meets his match. The blow which downs him is a medieval classic. In many medieval battles, they have found a large number of wounds to the left side of the body. The majority of people were right-handed, and when they executed a downward blow, most of them would be to the left side of the body. This would be a terrifically painful injury. With the shield arm disabled, the sergeant's fate is sealed. <laughs> Unlike the Templar sergeant, many of the other crusaders trapped in the castle are not experienced soldiers. The next skeleton examined reveals their fate. Despite the desperate efforts, the Crusader garrison defending Jacob's Ford cannot halt the advance. Saladin's men go on the rampage. This person was found um, splayed out on the ground one arm flung out. There's a dead mule lying on top of his arm. And these are his remains. This is his sacrum. This is the bone right at the end of the spine. It's made up of individual vertebrae which have fused together. 
but there's this little gap here which shows that this hasn't actually quite completed fusing. That tells us that it's probably an individual between the age of 18 to 25. Despite this man's youth, there's something wrong with his spine. If we look at these individual vertebrae, we can see on many of them uh, this hole. Now, that wouldn't be there normally. Holes like this are caused by carrying heavy weights, which put pressure on the spine. Soft tissue between uh, the vertebral bodies gets squashed down, and as it gets squashed down, it, it ruptures, and it causes this herniation effect in the vertebra. So this is somebody who's been carrying heavy materials, equipment, weights of one kind or another for quite a long time, probably f f since he was uh, a young boy. The evidence of child labor suggests this man comes from a low status background. More clues supporting this theory come from his teeth. He's lost a tooth here. There's also tooth decay here. A massive hole just there. That would have been extremely painful. He's also got a huge buildup of tartar. It's all this material you can see around here, just at the end of the teeth, towards the gum line. That means that he's had gum disease. As a result of that, he would have had extreme jungle breath. The appalling condition of his teeth and gums make him an unlikely soldier. Would you want a warrior you know, to be suffering from awful toothache? And oh, leave me alone, I've got toothache. If warriors were suffering from toothache, they'd pull the tooth out so that the guy can go and you know, do the business. All the clues suggest he is a poor man, employed as a laborer. Open up! Open up! He has no armor, no weapons, and knows little about fighting. But when the wall comes down, even a young laborer with bad teeth finds himself on the front line. A medieval army is not just about knights. The bulk of people are there as part-timers. They're not professional soldiers. They are required every so often to give some military service. It must have been absolutely terrifying. These are not men of war. People from all levels of society signed up for the crusade. You've got knights, you've got churchmen, peasants. There are a small group of Western Europeans who come over and conquered effectively an alien territory. At times of invasion, everybody is going to have to get involved. But part-timers are no match for Saladin's crack troops. I don't think that the Muslim forces of Saladin differentiated between warriors, those who were carpenters, blacksmiths, masons, sages, went through and killed whoever was in their way. There comes a point in every struggle where it breaks down to sort of two or three against one. Okay. It's a truly hellish scene. Knowing that you have no way out. You are absolutely pinned. There are no injuries on the young laborer's skeleton. This suggests he dies from a flesh wound. <laughs> the 
The trail of dead crusaders from all ranks and classes proves another key part of the Chronicle is correct. The battle does turn into a massacre. The fifth skeleton to be examined provides a shocking insight into what happens next. This man is found with appalling head injuries. A blade has gone into the back of the skull and then it's lifted a slice of cranial bone away. There is a blow to the left rear side of the skull, taking away a huge slice of bone, exposing some of the brainy matter underneath. And then another blow to the top of the skull here, lifting this piece of bone away. This attack was particularly brutal, merciless, frenzied, with no quarter given. Why one man is the target of such violence might be explained by unusual abrasion marks on his teeth. We can see here that this central incisor has been worn down to about half the size that it would normally be. And because of the amount of wear there, then we can imagine that there's some object being pushed backwards and forwards between uh, the teeth. The 7.5 millimeter wide gap holds the key to his identity. He could be working some bowstrings, perhaps. He may be using that tooth to strip away the bark of wooden arrow shafts. He might be working feathers with his teeth. It's compelling evidence that this man could be an archer. Crusader archers come from ordinary backgrounds and train from childhood to become deadly marksmen. They can fire eight arrows a minute and hit a target up to 300 meters away. Because of their lethal accuracy, they're hated by Saladin's men. In the final stages of the battle, I suspect many of them were simply butchered by the Muslims. The ferocity, the fervor of war at that moment means that the chances of them pausing and taking prisoners were quite low. And you can imagine a frenzy of blows. Whack, 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 whack on the back of the skull. They wanted to make sure this guy was dead. In the final stage of the battle, only a few crusaders are left standing, trapped at the south end of the castle. They lock themselves behind the barricades, behind the makeshift walls, and they try to defend themselves. The bones excavated from the castle ruins offer a chilling insight into the fate of these men. This is a very enigmatic skeleton. In the corner of his right arm and elbow, uh, there is this object here, a mass of coins, very likely held together in a purse. The coins are the first clue to who this man is. We can say that he was of a relatively high status because he is holding a tremendous amount of money. I mean, this is not small pocket money that any laborer, carpenter, blacksmith would have in his pocket. His cause of death confirms this is no ordinary crusader. It reveals that Saladin's men single him out for special treatment. They break the North Wall. When these stones were lifted, they looked very carefully for any small fragments of skull, and they weren't there. So what does appear to have killed him is the fact that he lost his head. 
Decapitation suggests execution. It's another clue suggesting this man is a high-ranking Templar Knight, entrusted with money to pay the castle workforce. His skeleton tells a gruesome story of his final moments. The first blow hits his right shoulder blade. The injury is just along here. And he's had a slice cut out of that. I can see that cut here very clearly. A really nice little wedge of bone that's just been chipped out. The next injury is to his right arm. He's taken a chunk out of his radius at this angle here, coming down close to his wrist. A blow to the back of the wrist here would have the effect of dividing the extensor tendons not only to the wrist but to the fingers. The wrist drops and you can no longer grip whatever you have in the hand. A third injury damages his right collarbone. You can see here, it's very clear cut. It's triangular in shape, and that mimics the shape of the metal arrowheads. <laughs> he was struck by an arrowhead, which then passed just underneath the collarbone. So it's come in at an angle here and just passed underneath and was probably lodged in to his shoulder joint. He may have just broken the shaft off and carried on fighting. Immobilized. The high-ranking Templar Knight is at the mercy of his assailants. His trapped comrades still have one extraordinary card to play. More bones recovered from the site suggest they respond with an act so brave it verges on insanity. As the Battle of Jacob's Ford draws to a close, something incredible happens. The evidence comes not from human, but animal bones. We found uh, three horses, like this one here, you see a femur. Most of the skeletons we found with hair heads, especially between the ribs, near the pelvis. The arrowheads suggest the horses die in battle, shot down by Saladin's archers. At Jacob's Ford, we found peculiar kite-shaped arrowheads. They're used mainly for hunting large game, and they were used in the battlefield against horses. The use of anti-horse arrows gives weight to an extraordinary story in the Muslim chronicles. They say the castle commander responds to the massacre of his men with an act of stunning bravery. In the desperation of closing stages of the battle, it's quite possible a number of the knights tried to break out. A final death and glory charge against the Muslims encapsulates the motivation of the Templars, their determination, some might say fanaticism. The large kite-shaped arrows would have been devastating. These things usually had a radius of about three to five centimeters, and it'd be like throwing an ax at someone.
But although heroic, the commander's horse charge is an act of desperation. He you know that he's going to be killed. He, he, it was a, a suicide act. The commander of the castle knows that he's going to be humiliated, tortured, and killed. The chronicles say he threw himself into a hole full of fire. And from this brazier, he was immediately thrown into another, that of hell. Al-Fadil. I tend to ask myself if what the commander of the Templars did is an act of bravery or act of cowardice. Because when he killed himself and he committed suicide, he left the whole army without a commander. The Chronicles talk of mass executions after the battle. Now is perhaps when the high-ranking Templar Knight meets his end. Executions after a battle send a number of messages to the enemy. They show that you have triumphed over them. You are showing no quarter, no mercy. This is what will happen if you resist us. The decapitation, evident from this crusader's skeleton, is final proof that the devastating Muslim victory described in the Chronicles is fact, not fiction. News of the massacre reaches King Baldwin before his relief army arrives at Jacob's Ford. He knows many of the 800 crusaders killed in the battle personally. Today, their bones bear the marks of a catastrophic battle which changes history. For Baldwin IV, it's a terrible blow, a reduction in his prestige and in his military strength. It allows Saladin to increase the pressure on the Christian lands, 